Last spring, the man dubbed the loneliest man in the universe passed away. His name was Michael Collins when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin detached in the lunar module to land on the moon. Michael Collins stayed in the command module to await their return. And as he orbited the moon for 28 hours, he was the most isolated man in history up to that point, thus his loneliest moniker. Here's how he described his feelings. I don't mean to deny a feeling of solitude. It is therefore reinforced by the fact that radio contact with the Earth abruptly cuts off at the instant I disappear behind the moon. I am alone now, truly alone, and absolutely isolated from any known life. I am it. If a count were taken, the score would be three billion plus two on the other side of the moon, and one plus God knows what on this side. Now that's lonely. But as far as the loneliest man in the world goes, as in the loneliest man on this planet, that title has been taken by Rudolf Hess. That was the title of his memoirs, anyway. I pride myself in bringing you stories from history that you won't find anywhere else, and I've got a doozy for you today. This is the almost unbelievable story of Deputy Fuhrer Rudolf Hess of the Nazi Party. Rudolf Walter Richard Hess was born on April 26, 1894, into a wealthy German family who lived in Egypt under British rule. And there, young Rudolf learned contempt for other races as he watched the British Empire dominate the native population. People of Northern Europe, in his mind, were more sophisticated than other groups, and the world would be a better place if they were in charge, he thought. Hess took these prejudices back home to the motherland when he enrolled in school and started working in the family trading business in Hamburg. When the Great War broke out in 1914, Hess immediately enlisted. He rose to the ranks quickly, but he was wounded while serving in Romania. During his convalescence, he made the decision to join the Luftwaffe, which was basically the Nazi Air Force. Hess learned to fly, but the war ended before he saw any action. However, his skill as a pilot would loom large later in life. After the war, the Hess business fell on hard times during the resulting economic depression. Everyone in Germany was disillusioned, and disillusionment often leads to bigotry, unfortunately. As the family business became less financially solvent, Hess became embittered toward the wealthy and industrious Jewish population. And in the ensuing years of pain, Hess found a comfortable landing place in the up-and-coming Nazi party. After he heard Adolf Hitler speak in Munich in 1920, he became devoted to the cause heart and soul. As it turned out, Hess was a perfect number two for Hitler. Rudolf did the fundraising and administrative work in the party, while Adolf did the crazy. Then Hitler and Hess attempted a coup d'etat in 1923, but were both arrested and ultimately imprisoned together in Landsberg Prison. This is where Hitler dictated his famous memoir, Mein Kampf, which Hess dutifully put to paper, setting the stage for the next revolution. Both men were eventually released, and in 1924, they immediately resumed their political activities. Hess became a close friend and confidant of Hitler, and when the Nazis seized power in 1933, Hitler installed Hess as deputy Führer, second in line to the throne, so to speak. Hess was a true ideologue. He never used his position within the Nazi party for power or prestige, nor was he interested in money. His main ambition was to please Hitler, and he saw himself as just another cog in the machine. The Nazi community had become his family, and he was wholly devoted to the cause. And that cause called for the annexation of Eastern Europe. After the German invasion of Poland in 1939, Hitler, or Hess's blind... Uh, anti-Semitism only increased. He was convinced that the so-called power-hungry Jews, in his words, were behind every German setback in history, and he was determined to suppress their influence as far as the Nazi regime spread. But Hess was a party man, not a general. He wasn't involved in military decisions, so as the war waged on, Hess's influence with Hitler diminished. And it's at this point that the history gets a little foggy. Evidently, Hess believed that Hitler's plan to invade the Soviet Union was foolhardy. The Germans were very much engaged in a war with Britain to the west, and they had little chance of winning a war on two fronts. So Hess, who had learned to fly in the First World War, got into a plane and flew himself to Scotland under the cover of darkness 
in an attempt to negotiate peace with Britain. This must have seemed absolutely insane. Can you imagine our vice president flying herself into a war zone? What in the world was going on here? Somehow Hess avoided British air defenses and bailed out of his plane before it crashed in Scotland. He was served tea by a Scottish farmer before being arrested and making national headlines. Under interrogation, Hess insisted that he was acting on his own initiative. He believed that Britain and Germany should be allies against the Soviets, and he was determined to make that happen with or without Hitler's approval. But that story just didn't make sense. He was Hitler's most loyal disciple, and he wouldn't have been able to pull off something like this without Hitler's support anyway. Surely he was just giving Hitler plausible deniability in case his mission failed. And to this day, some historians are convinced that Hitler knew about Hess's mission and gave his implicit approval. Well, Hess's mission did fail, and terribly. The British were in no mood to enter into a priest treaty with one of the most vilest regimes in history, and they dismissed Hess's offer out of hand. They didn't even take him seriously. Then, to add insult to injury, Hess was disavowed by the Nazis, who aren't known for their loyalty. Hitler claimed that Hess had lost his mind and in no way was speaking on behalf of the party. Curiously, however, Hitler quietly made sure a pension was paid to Hess's family in his absence. But Rudolf Hess was completely on his own now. He loved Germany and he respected the British, but neither would take him in. And at this point, bereft of any fellowship, Hess started to mentally unravel. He was confined briefly at the Tower of London before being sent to various prisons around the country for the duration of the war. And during his incarceration, he tried to kill himself twice, once by throwing himself down a flight of stairs and another time by stabbing himself with a butter knife. History, of course, has proven that Hitler should have listened to Hess as the Nazis were completely overrun in 1945 by the British and Americans from the East or from the West and the Soviets from the East. Hess was put on trial at Nuremberg with the rest of the captured high-ranking Nazi officials. Though psychiatrists diagnosed him to be suffering from delusions, he was nonetheless found competent to stand trial. But unlike most of his fellow Nazis, Hess avoided the hangman's noose. Hess was not part of the Nazi war machine, so there were no, there were no uh, war crimes to pin on him. And he left Germany before the systematic horrors of the Holocaust had begun. Try not to confuse Rudolf Hess with Rudolf Hoess, the notorious commandant of Auschwitz, two different people. But Hess did earn a life sentence for crimes against peace. He spent the next 40 years in the military prison complex at Spandau in Berlin. At first, he shared the facility with six former Nazis, but even they had little interaction with one another. And by 1966, all the other prisoners had either served their sentences or were released for health reasons, leaving Hess completely isolated for the next 21 years. He was allowed to walk outside for one hour per day. He could receive visitors for a half hour per month, and he was given four sheets of paper per month to write letters. Eventually, the French, American, and British authorities lobbied for his release on humanitarian grounds, but the Soviets would have none of it. And deprived of any community whatsoever, Hess teetered on the brink of insanity for years. Then on August 17, 1987, Rudolf Hess was found dangling from an electrical cord, the victim of an apparent suicide. I say apparent because there's folks who have a hard time making sense of how a feeble 93-year-old man could find the strength to hang himself. But then again, there's not much that makes sense about the life of Rudolf Hess. So why do I relate to you the unhappy life story of this man? Am I trying to drum up sympathy for a Nazi? I can assure you that is not the case because he was a shameful person. Though he didn't necessarily have as much blood on his hands as his colleagues, Rudolf Hess was an unapologetic Nazi sympathizer and anti-Semite until the day he died. But his life does present to us a valuable lesson. When a man loses his group identity, he loses everything. We were not made to be solitary, unaffiliated creatures. Growing up as a German under the jurisdiction of the British Empire, it was devastating for Rudolf Hess to lose his connection with both groups. He had made his home within the Nazi party, and as terrible as they were, they were somebody, and they turned on him. 
He was cut off from his friends and family, and he couldn't even identify with his fellow prisoners. And he died as the only living inmate in a prison built to house 600. I can't bring myself to feel sorry for Rudolf Hess, not even close, but I can learn from him. Without community, a man will eventually die. He may be alive outwardly, but he's dead on the inside. There's no peace, no joy, certainly no laughter. My friends, history is serious business. The pain that men like Rudolf Hess have caused down throughout the centuries is no laughing matter. But his misery underscores the importance of community. History has shown that man's greatest source of peace and joy come from a sense of togetherness. And today's psalm from Jewish history tells us that laughing together as a body is crucial if we are to survive these difficult times. Even in the most difficult circumstances, people have been able to laugh. And we need to learn how they were able to do that because it's an amazing show of strength. We need to laugh historically. So I'm going to encourage you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 126. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take out one of ours located underneath the pew in front of you and find page 517. Page 517, Psalm 126. You can also scan the QR code on your notes with your smartphone and it'll take you right to it. This is the eighth message of our summer series entitled My Theme Psalm. Every great movie needs a theme song. But so does every great life. And so what song would you like to be played every time you walked into a room? Hopefully it'd be something inspirational like Rachel Platten's fight song. Or if we had to be more honest, maybe our theme song would be something less inspiring like Linda Ronstadt's Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me. Nonetheless, it seems that God has created a theme song for each of our lives. And the ancient hymn book of Jewish worship, what we refer to as the book of Psalms, is filled with life themes. Maybe you can find your theme psalm. So far in our series, we've explored the themes of change, legacy, our nation, authenticity, money, and God's revelation from nature. If you've missed any of these messages, video recordings can be found on our website. Then last week, we talked about the importance of security. And for centuries, the Christian security has been found in community. History is one long, miserable dirge of suffering and violence, it seems. And there's nothing funny about the Holocaust or Nazis or any number of horrible things from the past. So our themes today may seem a bit contradictory. The believer in Jesus has been called to be blessed or happy despite the difficulties in this life. We've been called to laugh together in the midst of history's unhappy circumstances. And groups have proved throughout history that that is possible. And as we'll see today, this holy historical laughter can only be found in our bonds within the church. So let's look at Psalm 126. Psalmist wrote this, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Finally, a psalm of manageable length this morning. Now, unlike the other psalms we've looked at in recent weeks, the title of this psalm gives us no clues as to the author's identity. The title, of course, was not part of the original God-inspired scripture, but nonetheless was probably accurate historically. And while it does not identify the author, it does give us a clue to the occasion for which it was written. It's called a song of ascents. A few times per year, the Israelites would travel to Jerusalem for one of their religious festivals, Jesus himself observed these, as we see in John 5, 1. And there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And as the Jews climbed the hills to reach the elevated city, they would sing certain psalms from their sacred hymn book. But our passage today wasn't just any psalm of a sense. Evidently, it was written after an extremely difficult time in Jewish history. (laughs) Another difficult time in Jewish history. 
In verse 1, the psalmist wrote how God had recently restored the fortunes of Zion. Zion, by the way, is the hill upon which Jerusalem was built. So sometime in the past, God had reestablished Jerusalem. Now, what could he be talking about? Well, it seems that this psalm was written after the exile. I've given you some recent Jewish history today, but allow me to follow that up with some ancient history. The Israelites were God's chosen people, but they were still people. And as with all people, they had a penchant for being wicked sometimes. Just how bad could they get? Well, before the exile, the prophet Jeremiah leveled this accusation in his book, chapter 7, for the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set up their detestable things in the house that is called my name to defile it. And they have built the high places in Topheth, which is the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. And so why would the Israelite, Israelites do something so terrible? Well, the Israelites were a product of their culture like all of us. And that's how the heathens around them worship their gods. Besides, in their mind, what higher sign of devotion could a man show to his whatever deity he worshiped than by sacrificing one of his children? But that was never God's intention. God is for life, not against it. And he would never even think about asking his people to do such a thing. And though the prophets railed against this horrible cultural practice, the Israelites wouldn't stop. So God himself had to step in and stop it. And he did this through King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. In 586 B.C., the Babylonian Empire invaded the nation and leveled Jerusalem. And he hauled thousands of Jews back to Babylon with him. No one was going up to Jerusalem anymore. It seemed like game over. I want to try to put this catastrophe into some sort of modern context for you. Uh, By 1940, Hitler had turned his attention to France... And the Nazi army easily overran the country, leaving absolute chaos in its wake. Ten million French refugees fled the country, about a quarter of the nation's population. It would have been terrible. And on June 14th, Paris fell. Last year, on the 80th anniversary of the invasion, some of the precious few people old enough to have lived through that terrible experience were recruited by France 24 news site to recall some of their memories from that time. Here's how Claude Jovancey, what he wrote when he was was remembering back to when he was about seven years old at the time. And here's what he had to say about the Nazi invasion. He said, our hometown was bombed on June 13th. We spent more than half an hour lying under the bed. Can you imagine? We got used to seeing refugees from Belgium and the north of France fleeing the Germans, and we could see that it would soon be our turn. By the following evening, we'd gotten ready to leave. Our bikes were loaded, a few clothes, a blanket for each of us, and gas masks too. My mom rolled up a teddy bear for me and the blanket attached to my handlebars. As we stepped out onto the street that last time, she turned around, looked up, and said, goodbye, poor house. Our town was in flames when we left it, but we looked up and didn't know where to go. There were quite a few times when we missed the bombings by a whisker, but one time we were really exposed to them. Thank God we weren't hurt, but it was a baptism of fire. A bomb landed about 20 meters from us. I could see the planes that were bombing us, and my dad dove onto me, and I was almost crushed beneath his weight. We were in a ditch with ants and nettles, and my face was very itchy when I got up. It was very difficult to see people dying. Animals, too, mowed down by machine gun fire. I remember the smell of corpses. The horses' dead bodies would swell up in the heat of June. They were huge. We tried to avoid all dead bodies, those of animals and humans. I remember seeing a car upside down with a woman's feet sticking out. We didn't stop because it was clear they had been killed. There were also soldiers who dropped dead while they were in the middle of shooting. In total, we were on the road for 10 days. We'd travel 60 kilometers, no more than that. It ended when we were arrested in the middle of the night. The Germans told us we couldn't travel any further. The next day, we went back home, such as it was, part of a string of burning villages. The house had been shaken by the bombing, but it was still standing. It had been looted, but we were poor at the time anyway. My hometown was one of the worst hit places in France at the time. There was destruction everywhere. We can't imagine that kind of destruction, right? They could have, been, they, they could have never dreamed that 
France could bounce back from that kind of horribleness. But on August 24th, 1944, General Eisenhower commanded the force that pushed the Nazis back out of Paris, and the French rebuilt. But just because the Israelite exile happened 2,500 years ago doesn't mean that it didn't happen to real people. It took its toll on them and left an impression, just as the Nazis left on the French. In fact, we're still talking about it today. But as this was happening to the Israelites, look at what God promised to the prophet Jeremiah. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. And so are you telling me that after the greatest empire in the world had completely leveled Jerusalem, that somehow after 70 years, God would bring you back? How could anyone ever dream of such a scenario? But history tells us that's exactly what happened. The Israelites clung to God tenaciously during their captivity, and once that generation who had sinned so terribly was gone, the new generation was committed to God and doing things right and committed to life. And after a few decades, after Nebuchadnezzar had died, King Darius and the Persians came along and defeated the Babylonians. But Darius had no quarrel with the Israelites, so he allowed men like Ezra and Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city. And as they rebuilt Zion, they were rebuilding the nation. They reinstated proper worship in the capital. And once again, pilgrims returned to Zion to worship God during their festivals. God restored their fortunes just as he had promised. And it was so wonderful and so awe-inspiring that they could scarcely believe it. And that's when this psalm was written. To them, it was a dream, as the psalmist worded in verse 1. And as he said in verse 2, there was laughter as they went up. When is the last time you really laughed? Because historically speaking, we need to either laugh or curl up in a ball and die, it seems like. Commodus was a Roman emperor in the late second century, and from all accounts, he was a fool. He was an arrogant hothead who could not tolerate any inconvenience or perceived slight to his royal grandeur. One time, he had an attendant thrown into an oven because his bath water wasn't hot enough. So everyone was always on edge around Commodus. But Commodus didn't care much for the administration of the empire. Instead, he preferred to spend his time impressing people with his physical prowess. He fancied himself the reincarnation of Hercules, and he forced the public to pay exorbitant prices just to watch him skillfully kill disabled people in the Colosseum. He would fight gladiators in the arena where they would surrender to his superior skill, and amazingly, Commodus never lost a fight. Then, just for kicks, Commodus would hunt wild beasts in the arena. He would kill lions and bears and elephants, which were, of course, all safely restrained, so as not to pose any real threat to the emperor. It was a grotesque display of unbridled narcissism. But evidently, Commodus was so obtuse that he didn't realize that everyone was quietly laughing at him behind his back. His flamboyant costumes made for a ridiculous spectacle. And we get an account of one of his performances from a young senator named Lucius Cassius Dio. It was customary for the Roman Senate to sit in the front row of the gladiatorial contest, whether they wanted to or not. And after slaying an ostrich, Commodus attempted to intimidate the senators. He walked over to where they were sitting, brandishing a bloody sword in one hand and the ostrich's head in the other, and gestured that they could be next. But instead of being frightened, the senators burst out into laughter. They couldn't help it. Commodus looked like a fool. Here's how Dio recounted the absurd display. He said, many would have been put to death on the spot by the sword for laughing at him, for it was laughter that took hold of us rather than distress. If I had not taken some laurel leaves from my garland and chewed on them and persuaded the others sitting near me to do the same, 
so that by continually moving our mouths, we might hide the fact that we were laughing. Dio could only laugh. Why? Because of the camaraderie of his fellow senators. He couldn't have done it on his own. And we need to laugh like this. We need to laugh in the face of the dangers the world possesses. Historically speaking, God laughed at people like Commodus. Look at Psalm 37. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him, but the Lord laughs at the wicked. And he encourages us to laugh with him, especially at men who think they are powerful. Psalm 52. The righteous will see in fear. They will laugh at you, saying, Here now is the man who did not make his God his stronghold, but trusted in his great wealth and grew strong by destroying others. Thanks to God defeating those who thought they were so powerful, the Israelites were a community again, and as a result, they could laugh together once more. They were blessed so much, in fact, that it says in verse 2, there were shouts of joy as they ascended the hill to Jerusalem once again. Laughter and shouting were part of their communal worship. We underestimate the joy derived from community, and the nations around them noticed it. They said in verse 2, the Lord has done great things for them. And the Israelites acknowledged it in verse 3, the Lord has done great things for us. And we are glad. Can't experience this kind of gladness alone. In verse 4 it says, the gladness gushed out of them like streams in the Negev. The metaphor here is flash floods filling to the dry river basins in the desert whenever rain came along. It was a torrent of sudden joy. Joy is multiplied when it becomes a shared experience. But in the second half of this psalm, the focus shifts from the present to the future. It wasn't just about the joy the Israelites were feeling at that time. The future would also be filled with communal joy. As the psalmist said in verse 5, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. It reminds me of something Jesus said in Luke 6, 21, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Not only that, but the future will also be filled with individual joy. As the psalmist shifted from the plural pronouns to singular in verse 6, he said, he who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy. And this is a wonderful expression of Christianity, which of course was still in the future from the psalmist's perspective. We see the same communal yet individual joy in the gospel. Jesus said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In the original Greek language of the New Testament, the word whosoever here is singular. Each individual person should believe in Jesus for salvation. The good news is that Jesus lived the perfect life we could not live. He died on the cross for our sins, and he was resurrected for every single person individual and salvation comes to the one who through simple faith trusts in Jesus not in works as the apostle Paul has said in Romans 4 5 and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted as righteousness salvation is personal yet at the same time every ounce of Christian living is communal what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of fullness of Christ. Did you catch that? The fullness of Christ is attained not by individuals, but in the unity of the body of Christ Christ which is the church. He reinforces this in, verse, or in chapter 1 of Ephesians. God placed all things under his feet, Jesus, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The only way you will come to the fullness of the knowledge of Jesus and become fully mature is through the church. The only way you'll experience Jesus the way you've always wanted to is alongside other believers. So you can read the Bible and pray on your own, and you should, but your spiritual growth as an individual will still be limited 
unless you are experiencing Jesus with the rest of us. There is a limit to your joy, your peace, your confidence, your security, and laughter outside the community of faith. Christianity is not a solitary endeavor. It is a together experience. And that's our main point from today's psalm. And it's in your notes if you'd like to write it down. The main point is, it's all about we. It's all about we. My friends, if you are doing Christianity alone, you are doing it wrong. If you are trying to experience Jesus on your own, you are only getting a small piece of the picture. The full portrait of Jesus can only come together with the rest of the church. Do you ever leave your personal devotion time feeling sometimes a little unfulfilled? Do you want more of Jesus but can't seem to get it? Have you not been able to figure this thing out yet? Do you feel stuck and unhappy and depressed? Then maybe you're focused a little too much on your personal relationship with Jesus and not enough on the communal relationship with Jesus. Because the fullness of Jesus, according to Paul, can only be found in the body of believers. You're only getting a fraction of Jesus by looking for him on your own. You're only getting a fraction of his knowledge in your personal Bible study. You're only getting a fraction of his joy and peace when you are by yourself. If we want to experience the fullness of Christ, then we need to get our noses out of the books and start living the Christian life together. Because I've got to be honest with you, I feel more of the presence of Christ when I'm having lunch with a brother than I do sitting by myself reading the Bible sometimes, as important as that is, and I'm not discounting that. The essence of Jesus' message is loving other people, and you cannot do that by yourself. You cannot pursue Jesus fully on your own. Men especially are afraid of getting close to other people for whatever reason. But listen, you will never be happy by yourself ultimately. Believe me, I love sweet solitude. The more crazy my life gets, the more I'd like to be shot into space for a few hours and out of radio contact on the dark side of the moon. And there's a time for solitude and meditation and quietness and personal prayer and Bible study. We've talked about that. Jesus did that. I'm not discounting that. But Jesus did, didn't live most of his life on some mountaintop like the other spiritual gurus of history. Jesus was a man of the people. And stunningly, he put Christians being in the presence of other Christians on par with Christians being in the presence of God. Let me say that again. Jesus put Christians being in the presence of other Christians on par with Christians being in the presence of God. Look at it, John 17. This is what Jesus said. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, talking about the apostles, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. It's a stunning statement. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought together to complete unity. We don't often read the King James Version of the Bible, and that's not because it's not a good translation. It is. But the translation of the King James Bible was completed in 1611, literally during the time of Shakespeare. And back then, people actually talk like Shakespearean actors with thee and thou. Now, we don't talk like that anymore, so more modern translations work better for us. But there's still something really great we can learn from the King James Bible. When you see the word thee or thou in the King James Version, you know the author is talking to individual persons. Thee and thou are the singular forms of you in Old English. But when you see ye and you in the King James Version, you, then you know the author is talking to a group of people collectively because these are the plural forms of you in Old English. And so read the King James Version in your devotion sometimes and notice the difference. But guess what? Almost every command and exhortation and encouragement in the Bible is not given to thee and thou, singular, but to ye and you, plural. In other words, Christianity is meant to be experienced in the plural. All the obedience, all the encouragement, it's given to the plural, the body. 
So let's go back to our psalm today. We see all the laughing and the shouting, and we're kind of envious, right? We don't tend to laugh and shout. I can't remember the last time I shouted for joy about anything, and but this is kind of life we crave, isn't it? This is life as it was meant to be lived, but it falls woefully short of what we experience. And so why? Because American Christians are solitary creatures. We're trying to have the joy and the laughter and the shouting all alone. But do you know what you call a man who laughs and shouts when he's all alone? A crazy person. Look at the pronouns in this psalm. We is in verse 1. Our and them is in verse 2. And us is in verse 3. But it goes further than that. Look again at verse 2. The psalmist says that our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. Our is plural, but mouth and tongue are singular. The nation was laughing and shouting as with one mouth and one tongue. If you want to laugh historically, that is according to biblical history, then you must laugh with the body. You cannot achieve this Jesus level of joy and peace and security on your own. It doesn't work that way. And that's our application from today's psalm. It's in your bulletin. The application is pull yourselves together. Pull yourselves together. Look at what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2.2. 2, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. You see, his joy wasn't complete until everyone pulled together. I would venture to say that most of us would say, yeah, my joy is not complete. How did Paul complete his joy? Everyone pulled together in unity. Christianity wasn't meant to be lived any other way. It doesn't work that way. And look, this isn't some ploy to increase church attendance. I'm not concerned about numbers. I'm concerned about you and your well-being. And if you feel like something is missing in your spiritual life, then it's probably a lack of togetherness. If you aren't getting much out of your personal quiet time, then maybe you also need to pray and study the Bible in a small group. We will be that community for you, but you need to let us in. You need to take some initiative to relate to others in this church on a level that goes deeper than just the surface. We can't do it for you, or we would. You must enter into life with us through ministry and mission and prayer and Bible study and one-on-one -on -one friendships. And for some folks, that's not easy to do, and I get that. But I'll help you. You just need to let me know that's what you want. You'll never see all of Jesus within yourself only. The body of Jesus completes the picture. Your joy will always be limited on your own, but it will always multiply with other believers. Yes, I know the American church is a mess. We've all been clubbed to death by churches in our past, absolutely. But listen, we aren't those churches. You ever been to a church that doesn't twist your arm for money? You ever been to a church that loves you for who you are? Have you ever been to a church that gives money away and helps drug addicts and reaches out to the community, all without shaming or manipulating its people into service? That's us. This church isn't perfect, but it's not some academic egghead institution that's afraid to get its hands dirty. We live together and we defend one another and protect each other. And we welcome the sinner with open arms and we laugh historically. If this past year has taught us anything, it's that merely listening to a sermon at home, it's not enough. That's not Christianity. It's good and valuable and worthwhile, but it's not Christianity. Because Christianity isn't just Bible study or teaching. Jesus is all about we. So we can never forsake the practice of pulling ourselves together. When we get ourselves together next week, we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects. It's fitting that Psalm 131 is so concise because what else would we expect from a psalm about simplicity? 
So let's pray. Lord, thank you for these people. Thank you that, you know, God, that they have pulled together. They, 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 these, these folks pull themselves together every week. And Lord, I just thank you for that, Lord. We will never take that for granted here. Each individual here is part of this body, and their presence is invaluable. I thank you for each of them, Lord. I thank you for each one. God, I'm so thankful that they take the time out of their Sunday mornings and they wrestle the kids and they get them here. And Lord, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that Christianity in their life as a result would work as it's supposed to. Thank you, God, for this body. Thank you for these people who sacrifice for it and protect other people and encourage them with their presence. I pray you would do that more and more. And Lord, uh, I pray for the folks here who maybe they aren't experiencing that fullness. Maybe there's, uh, their Christian life is lacking and they know it, Lord, and, and there's something missing. And as they thought about it, maybe it is that togetherness. And I pray, Lord, that that they would let us in, that they would really become a part of this body more deeply, that they would get involved with the mission here, the praying and the Bible study and the community. I know that's hard for some people, Lord. They've been burned by churches or they just don't make friends easy or they're suspicious of people. And God, I understand that. But I pray they would take the step and really let us in and let us bless them and they to bless us and the fullness of Jesus could be seen in them. I pray that for us, Lord. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name, amen.